Well, good morning, everyone, and, and welcome for joining our program. It's wonderful to see so many people interested in the polls in, in Utica and the settlement of, of those people. For many of us, this is the story of our grandparents, our great grandparents, and even ancestors farther back. And for anyone tuning in, for everyone tuning in, it's the story of a city. And so it's a story that we can all, all share. Poles began to settle in Utica in earnest more than 140 years ago. It's a staggering um, length of time. Their settlement had its greatest concentration in West Utica, and that's what we're gonna look at. What I'm reporting to you today, I found in the public record, and it reflects my perspective. Um, other people might have different perspectives, but this is mine. It's a very rich story. And so we're gonna have to uh, focus it today on a few things. Utica and West Utica from the early 1880s to the end of World War I. We're gonna look at local industries, We'll look at the push and pull of Polish immigration, Holy Trinity as an anchor to this Polish community. And we'll also look at a brief case study to kind of bring the people to life uh, as best we can. Now, it's very important to know that, or we, to understand the Polish settlement, we have to look back to Europe because that affects what happens here in the US. Poland lives in a very tough neighborhood. In the 1700s, it had a weak government and strong neighbors, Russia, Prussia, and Austria, and they devoured it. So that by 1795, Poland as a separate country no longer existed. The Poles, however, continued to live where they were. If they lived on the land that was now Prussia, they were Prussian citizens. If they lived in the Russian sector, they were now Russian citizens. And as you can see from the map, Russia had the biggest piece of territory. Partitions meant differences. As I mentioned already, if you were a citizen of Prussia, Russia, or Austria, you were a citizen of those countries. The laws in those empires differed, as did the policies and practices and even the official languages. If you lived in Prussia or Austria, you now had German as your official language. In Russia, Russian was the official language. But at the same time, the vernacular languages continued to be used. So if you were Polish, you spoke Polish. If you were Ukrainian, you spoke Ukrainian and so on. Latin remained the language of the Roman Catholic Church for liturgy and for keeping the, the, val the uh, vital records, the births, the marriages, the deaths, so that if you do family history and you use the Polish sources, you'll see often, depending on where your ancestor came from, you'll see those records are in Latin. Cultural tolerance um, differed. <clears throat> um, in Austria, the Poles were reasonably well tolerated and sometimes Polish uh, culture was even supported. In Russia and Prussia, not so. Europe in the 20th century was a, a continent in transition. In the West, the Industrial Revolution was in full, full blown so that they were building factories and developing technologies. They were building transportation systems. Um, Canal networks came first, and then railroads, which they moved from west, which developed from the prosperous and developed and richer west to the less developed, the agrarian and poorer east. That is where the Poles live. Social change also occurred during the century. There was a move from the farm to the city where people worked in the factories. The working conditions were not terribly good and the living conditions were probably, were often worse. Our most important or focus is on the abolition of serfdom. Prussia abolished serfdom in 1807, very early. 
Austria had abolished it by law in 1791, but the practice continued to mid-century more or less. In Russia, Russia was late, didn't abolish serfdom until 1864. Now, what serfdom did, it was a, both an economic and a social system. The peasants who were the greatest number of people in these places, um, they lived on the land, they worked the land, but they did not own it. They worked it for the nobility. When you work for somebody else and the, the bulk of your product goes to their benefit, you can't develop um, wealth very easily. So the peasants were quite poor. When serfdom ended, they could now own land, but it came with a lot of debt. They already paid very high taxes. And though they could move, now they could move if they were able, leaving ancestral lands was not very easy at all. So the century saw several big waves of emigration. We know about the Irish, more than a million came to the US after the potato famine. Revolutions in Europe, which failed, sent a lot of German Catholics to the US, including to Utica, and they settled around St. Joseph Church. And in, in the 20 years, 1870, 1890, Prussian policy became even more severe so that Polish culture, religion, education was pretty much repressed. Those Poles in Prussia then began to come to Utica. There were factors uh, across the partitions that propelled Polish immigration regardless of the empire. Poverty first and foremost, high taxes. The population was growing. Inheritance laws. By those laws, it was only the oldest son who inherited the land. Younger sons and daughters didn't. If a woman died and her husband remarried and had a second family, that second family was entitled to nothing as far as the law. We'll find that many second families, the whole family emigrated one after another until none, nobody from the second family was left because there was no way to make a living. Military service was compulsory in Austria it could last just about a year. In Russia, it could last 25 years or a lifetime. There was illness, cholera, which is a cursed word in the Polish language, um, was not uncommon. And when it came through a village, it left a lot of death in its wake. Overall, change was very slow to come to Europe. And now I can't get it to move forward. Okay, so who left? And here's a generalized profile from many, many searches that I've done um, looking at immigration, immigrants. They were farmers. They lived in rural areas. People from the big cities generally didn't leave. They came from small villages. They were used to working the land with um, manual labor. Some had crafts. Some were cobblers or bakers or tailors. Overall, the family was an economic unit. Everyone, every generation had to contribute. If you didn't work, you didn't eat. Fairly simple. Not surprisingly, a lot of the immigrants were single, males and females, all roughly between the ages of 15 and 30. These were the people who didn't have a lot of responsibilities. They had energy, they were willing to take a risk and um, they did. Married people did come. They tended to be younger married people with not a lot of children. Now, all of these are generalizations. Husbands usually, came, or often I should say, came first, worked in a factory, made money, sent it back so that the wife could come. Often the wife would bring children, especially if they were infants or mid-teens, but not uncommon for older children to have to wait their turn before the family already in America could make uh, enough money for the passage. Rarely did any of these immigrants travel alone. They were with cousins or relatives or certainly people from the village or the next village. Um, it was a long trip, it was well over 3,000 miles. 
Why did they come to the US? They could have gone to Western Europe. Well, America was so much more appealing. It had so much opportunity. First and foremost, the opportunity to work with money that they earned from work, they could afford families, they could buy property, they could be healthy, they could avoid war. They had relatives who went ahead, who sent money for the, for the journey, gave them a place to live, help them find a job. Um, they had a community to come to. Also a factor is that this was a systematized process. It wasn't haphazard, it wasn't random. Many of the uh, textile mills in New England sent recruiting agents into the villages uh, to tell them how good work was here, that they would have, they could earn money and they would have a place to live and the work was clean and it was good. Also important was that there was scheduled, reliable, affordable transportation from the nearest railroad. Remember, the railroads are building generally from the west to the east. And as it came through the villages, it made leaving so much easier. You got on the train and when you got off, you entered the ship. Usually it was either Bremen or Hamburg. You sailed across the sea and you were processed very efficiently at the U.S. seaports. It, it didn't take long. The seaports processing was very quick. And then you had transport with, within the U.S. Utica had a lot of appeal. Um, for one thing, it had, it had jobs and it had a lot of jobs. It had housing. There were compatriots already here. No military service, didn't have to look at, at that. When you came to work, you were gonna be able to work. It had freedom of religion and it had existing Catholic churches. Very important because the Poles overall were quite religious people. It was a tolerant country. Um, it wasn't that the Poles could, could come without being mocked. I mean, they wore strange clothes and they had strange haircuts and they certainly spoke a very strange language. So lots of times they were called names, but even so, it was a tolerant country. Utica, it, it, it had clean running water. And I put that in there because when I looked at the 1900 city directory for Utica, there's a section that shows the, the images of the factories that were here. And then there was an image of the beautiful Utica Reservoir telling me that water was, it was important for industry. And this was appealing to anybody who wanted to open a factory in Utica, but it also meant because it was going to be clean running water that the workers would have good health and be able to work. Utica also had easy access. Here then is, um, let me see if I can, okay. Uh, oops, okay, space one, a bird's eye view over Bag Square. It's a marvelous, marvelous little photo. And it speaks a lot to what Utica already was in the 1850s. On the bottom of the, the image um, is the train, a quaint one, but it looks like it has a lot of passenger cars. Utica had broad streets. This is a beautiful, beautiful view looking, looking south. It had masonry buildings, three, four, five stories, speaking to the prosperity and the economy of the city. It had churches. The church steeples are quite conspicuous. And it had factories. I think I counted 11 big smokestacks spewing out. I mean, it had dirty air too, but the looks of it. I'm sure one of those, uh, several of those smokestacks are all, uh, found in East, and uh, rather in East Utica. Yeah, they are in East Utica, but also in West Utica. In the, early 19th, in the early 20th century, the Erie Canal was still being used. You can see from the uh, cargo um, barges uh, moored <clears throat> next to what are no doubt warehouses. On the left of that image, you can see the mules which haul the barges. The canal wasn't very deep. It was what, four feet deep, five feet deep. It wasn't very deep at all. It was no longer used so much for passengers because you had the train. It was used for cargo. 
Utica also had a beautiful uh, shopping district, with very broad street, uh, speaking to um, a, a good good vista for the city. Um, yes, horse-drawn carriages were still being used, but in the distance is a trolley, because Utica already had a trolley line. Utica had industry, the metal industries, um, Bazards, International Heater, Savage Repeating Arms, the gun manufacturers, Utica Cutlery, where all kinds of cutting um, implements were made. Utica Drop Forge, already in 1900, Utica Drop Forge was here. Utica Steam Engine and Boiler Works, the place where they made the heavy duty boilers and heaters and heavy equipment for the other industries in the city. Utica had textiles, and that's probably even more prominent than any other industry in Utica were the textile mills at this time. I made a list, again, this is from the city directory in 1900, um, of the ones in East Utica. Um, that was all that I could fit on the screen. And there were others, of course, in New York Mills and in basically wherever you look in central New York or in, this, in the Utica area, you will find a textile mill. Some small, some large. In West Utica, we found Globe Woolen Mill and Utica Steam Cotton. These are in the near west side, not far from Genesee Street, the main street. Each mill, Globe Mill and Utica Steam Cotton, employed over a thousand people in their factories. And here is an image of <clears throat> a sewing room uh, in an area mill from the 1890s. It wouldn't be much different in 1900. Several things come to mind immediately. The first is how close these workstations are. I don't know how many are in this, this image. My guess is maybe 60, 70, maybe close to 100 because uh, it goes so far. All of the work workers sitting at the sewing machine are women. In some ways, this makes a lot of sense because women sew for their own uh, clothing. So working in a factory was not going to be that much different and working a sewing machine would not have been a terribly uh, difficult machine to you to learn how to use. All their hair is is pulled back or put up into um, um, coiffures um, as a safety hazard. You don't want long hair caught in a sewing machine. And there were accidents. There were industrial accidents in the textile mills. The women are dressed in uh, nice blouses. Almost all of them are white, which suggests to me that um, they knew the photograph was going to be taken and they were urged to wear their best, uh, which they did. The other thing which um, of course stands out is the men standing on the side. No doubt the supervisors or even some of the mill administration. <clears throat> Young women coming from Poland when they came as single women could easily find jobs in the textile mills and they did. Young single women uh, came here and came um, quickly to work. This map shows the placement of these mills. Starting at the top of the, mill of the map is the Erie Canal. And north of that, not too far, but outside this map is the railroad. This is early where the early, early poles settled because this was more or less the low rent district. And as they earned money and as housing became available, they would move down the map. <clears throat> Next came on the left, St. Joseph Church. Already the Germans were living in this area and um, this was the German church. Yes, the liturgy would be in Latin, so the Poles would be comfortable. The language that the people would be speaking was German. You're coming from Prussia, where German, you're used to German. You could speak with them. You understood what they were saying. It was a natural place for the Poles to settle. And again, if you do any family history, you will find the early Poles uh, married, were baptized, and unfortunately, some of them did die 
and they were buried um, in the St. Joseph's Cemetery, which at this time was just north of the church. On the east side of the map, and this would have been maybe four or five blocks west of Genesee Street, is Utica Steen Cotton running three blocks here. Spring Street is noted. The workers who worked here as well as later or farther west in the Globe Mill would live in these dense, densely populated or housed. Housing was very densely uh, sited. To the west, four blocks, I think it is, Globe Mill um, is, is visible, <clears throat> taking up almost a whole city block as well. 1880, the Poles begin to arrive in numbers, if, as we've noted. Um, the first one that I found on the page really was Valenti Dreza. Um, most of us would be familiar with that name because eventually Valenti established an uh, a funeral parlor. He was called an undertaker. He was born in 1870, arrived in the mid 1880s. He was no more than 16 years old when he came. The woman he married, and they married in St. Joseph Church, arrived in 1889. <clears throat> Excuse me, both of them were from Posen, which is, uh, we now know as Poznań. It was in the uh, Prussian Empire. Uh, others who were associated, and yes, Valenti in the 1893 city directorate all the way through to 1900 is listed as a weaver. And where does he live? He lives on Spring Street within walking distance of Utica Steam Cotton. But it was also within walking distance of Globe Mill. So we don't know where he worked. He also could have worked in one of the other mills that was that was listed. Would have been farther to walk, it would have taken longer, but it was it was done. The other people on here, Valentine uh, Valenti in Polish, Wojciechowski, and I'm sure this is a relative, possibly even a brother, Frank, both from Prussia, both arrived in 1889, both working in the textile, um, with, with textiles. The only one who was a laborer in this period was John Sandowski, who lived on Water Street, and Water Street was close to the canal. The one I want to point out is Valentine Wojciechowski's wife, Mary, who was born in 1871 in New York State, meaning her parents came very among the earliest um, of the Poles who came here. Let's look at the Globe Woolen Mill, um, five, four blocks west of uh, Utica Steam Cotton. Company organized in 1847. I'm sure it was one of those smokestacks, belching, belching smoke that we saw in that overview of Bag Square. Um, it was organized um, by Theodore Faxton, great benefactor uh, of Utica. Faxton Hospital was his gift to the city. There were many other uh, philanthropic things that Faxton did, um, but he did, was a founder of the Globe Mill. 1871, fire destroyed the, all the buildings. Faxton, however, was determined to rebuild, to make it bigger, and more substantial. It would be a four-story building in the Italianate style, and it filled much of the block um, of Court and Stark Street, and this is what it looked like. It was an elegant building, um, very narrow, narrow windows with the arch um, top, <clears throat> a belfry, which for sure had a mill bell in it that would summon the workers uh, to to work and would release them. And it was, it was, it was beautiful. I must confess, I had never seen this image because this is what I was used to growing up in Utica, which is the way the Globe Mill appears today. And it came about because in 1916, the mill was sold to the American Woolen Company, um, um, I'd say a conglomerate, owned lots of textile mills in New England and the East Coast. They wanted more production capacity. So they tore down the belfry, tore down the first story and added um, an addition which fronts the street. It's very functional architecturally. It's not terribly interesting. 
it is what we see when we uh, watch the boiler maker and drive by. <clears throat> a few years ago, people nominated the Globe Mill to the National Register of Historic Places because of its significant association with one of Utica's dominant industries, that is textiles, and because it's one of the most intact woolen mill complexes still standing in the city. The nomination was accepted and as of January 2016, five years ago, it is now on the Register of Historic Places. All of this industry um, had to operate with people that needed laborers. There wasn't, there was mechanization, but there wasn't much. It all depended on still on people. A natural um, birth rate will not give the kind of population growth that this chart shows Utica went through in the period from roughly 1890 to 1920, when Utica's population grew by 114%. Utica, in those, in 30 years, Utica added 50,000 people. The way you get that is through immigration or bringing people in from other parts of your country that, and they had their own needs for labor. It's worth noting that in 1907, a one and a quarter million immigrants passed through Ellis Island. That was the highest number that was ever recorded. And they were able to get that many people through because they were so efficient at Ellis Island. Of course, with that many people being added to the population, it showed up in the 1910 census where almost 15% of the US population is foreign born. We've never had a, a percentage that was that high. World War I interrupted that flow. Now the trains are being used to ship soldiers and um, guns and armor and things. And also uh, America changed its mind about how many more immigrants it wanted. And so in 1924, the immigration laws changed severely restricting, especially immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe. But the immigrants who were here, by and large, they stayed here. With the numbers that had grown, they stayed largely on the west side for practical purposes. If they were working in, especially the textile mills, they were going to be able to walk to work. There were poles already in the area. They could speak their language. The, the, the things that we went over as to why Utica was so um, popular or had such appeal. In 1889, still attending church at St. Joseph's, um, a dozen or so of them established um, an aid society named after their favorite Polish saint, St. Stanislaus the Bishop. A few years later, there were more Poles and um, the need and the interest in having a parish was very strong. So now you have 50 families who get together and say, we wanna establish a parish, the diocese agrees, a full-time priest is brought in, the people pool their money, they buy a couple of lots, one for a, a, a house already standing that could be used as a church temporarily while they built a new church, which they did in 1897. And from this image, you can see that it was a, a modest church built in the style of the churches that were are pretty prevalent in um, the rural areas of Poland. Uh, stone foundation, brick structure, um, say, sat about 500 people. Uh, expected to be in use for several generations. The church, I put this on just to show you in relation to where it is. This is Holy Trinity Church off of Lincoln Ave, just with, clearly within walking distance of where the Poles lived. Um, there is Utica Steam Cotton. Uh, the Globe Mill is located. St. Joseph Church is within walking distance of that. And all of this area um, where the Poles lived. We don't know how many Poles came to Utica and we don't know how many Poles uh, immigrated to the U.S. because on the immigration form, which was the ship's manifest, 
it asks each person, what country are you a citizen of? There was no Poland. So these people had to answer that they were citizens of Austria or citizens of Prussia or citizens of Russia. And that's what appears on the ship manifests, which are the immigration forms that still exist. So we don't know. I don't know that we can even guess, but we can get some notion from the marriages and the christenings that were done at Holy Trinity. So these are charts that show the growth from 1897 to 1918. You can see in the marriages in 1897, the first year that the new church was opened, the year after the parish was formed, there are fewer than 20 marriages. Now that begins to grow um, so that 1903, you're over 80. Uh, in 1905, you're over 100 marriages. Remember, a lot of people who came were singles. And by, uh, what is it, 1907, there's 160, or almost uh, 180 marriages. And that number stays high for quite some time until World War I intervenes. Christenings show um, also a very steep climb. 1897, first year of the new church, under 50 babies baptized. By 1907, we're over 300. And in 1909, well over 400. And while the number decreased a bit, it dipped, it still remained high. So in 1918, you still had over 400 christenings. This, this period, 1900 to 1915, Utica was flourishing. It was a very prosperous city. It was during this time that Utica built Utica Public Library, the Savings Bank of Utica, Union Station, uh, Hotel Utica, and there, there were others. And these buildings make a, a very strong and definitive statement that Utica was prosperous. Utica saw itself devoted to culture and work and transportation and uh, economy savings. Uh, it's, it's a marvelous statement, these buildings, which still exist and for which we have to be very thankful that they were preserved. The similar thing was happening at Holy Trinity. As the population of Poles grew, it quickly, um, they overwhelmed the old church or the, the, the 1897 church because it wasn't big enough to handle them. So in 1906, um, it was proposed that they start building and they did uh, begin to build a new church. It took them five years. This is a church built in the Gothic style. It is a marvelous, marvelous structure. It's built of granite. There is marble inside. There are beautiful windows crafted in, in Munich, no less. If you pick this church up and put it down any place in France, it would look right at home. It's a gorgeous church. It, it cost somewhere between $125,000 and $150,000, an incredible small sum, and it was paid for by the parishioners. It seated double the number of the other church, and even so, with attendance, masses were often, uh, people were standing in, in the, the aisles. What the church offered in addition to uh, the spiritual counseling of its people, of course it offered the Polish language, it was accessible. People could walk to it and um, they could have a social life there because the church also had societies, it had choirs and bands and drama groups and political initiatives. So it offered a social milieu that the Poles could enjoy and contribute to. In other words, or in summary, this church, yes, represented by the building, but it offered uh, a statement of purpose and a statement of pride that this is what the Poles could accomplish. Polish businesses, yes. 
People came, they worked, they saved money, and they opened businesses. There's our friend Valenti Dreza, now known as Walter. This is 1912. He's no longer a weaver in uh, the textile mills. He's a photographer. Hmm. He has his studio and I believe his house on Lincoln Ave, where the Dresas uh, lived for many, many years, um, decades really. Frank Coster, the furniture dealer, also had a place on Lincoln Ave. Shatko had a bakery. Vladislav Tarczynski was a real estate agent. This came as a surprise because this is only 1912. When I paused and realized that owning a house was very important to the Poles, and this was one of the things they wanted to do when they got when they accumulated enough wealth. Well, who do you need to help you buy a house but a real estate agent? What's even more interesting is that his neighbor was a real estate agent also, and there were others in the area. Lincoln Ave was known, these people, I, I didn't search all of them, but um, Lincoln Ave was known as the Prussian Street. The people who lived there, and I did check some other um, residences at the time, they were from Prussia, that is, they had lived in the, in the Prussian Empire. The, the, the greatest number of businesses that they own, <clears throat> that Poles own were grocery businesses. Ah, oh, yes. Um, I don't think these are all of them. These are the ones that I recognized as having Polish names. Um, names often were um, corrupted and sometimes changed. And unless I knew they were Polish, I, I couldn't pick them out. Um, but these were obviously Polish. Uh, Lincoln Ave was a major shopping area, but there were shopping districts also on Whitesboro Street and Canal Street. There is uh, Joseph Sueto, who has a, a, a grocery on Canal Street. Karl Shapulski had a men's clothier store on Canal Street. And Josef Jastremski had a barbershop there. With these locations of the um, small businesses, they located where Poles lived. So you can begin to see uh, some of the settlements and where Poles concentrated in the near side of West Utica. I wanna to turn to um, a case study um, to get a view on the ground as I was calling it. And uh, chose Stark Street for a number of reasons. Um, proximity to Globe Mill, so I could get an idea of yeah, where people lived and where they worked. It's a long block. It has many people on it. Um, it's a working class block. Um, there is a lot of data, uh, information about these people. And also, it's my block. This is where I grew up. So I'm familiar with the names. And that was important because as records were kept, census um, records, name by name by name. They, the censuses were taken by English speaking people. They were not familiar with Polish names and they ended up spelling them as best they could. Um, and they're not always uh, clear as to who that person was. Because I lived on the block, I could recall what those names were supposed to be and try to put them in their real Polish spelling so that I could then look for them in other censuses or in other records. I also chose this because I thought it was emblematic of many and perhaps most of the blocks in the near west side where the Poles settled. Now, <clears throat> on that block in the 1900 census, there were 23 houses and 131 people. Roughly 70% were adults, 30% were kids. Um, gender, well, more women, not by much, uh, than men. Married people, uh, more, than, more married than single, about 50 to 40. Uh, and widows, or widowed people, four men, three women. 93% of these adults were literate. They could read and write. 
and that was a little bit above the national average for 1900. Six of them, though, could not read or write, and one, a woman, I thought sad, she could read, but she could not write. <clears throat> so where were these people come from? Where did they, where did, where were they born? In 1900, um, 52 adults born in the U.S., um, most of them born in New York State. Children, uh, only one was born abroad, and most of them, like their parents, were born in New York State. Of the adults born abroad, most of them, they were all from Western Europe. Um, the, the biggest numbers were 12 from Germany and 12 from Wales. I didn't know. I, I expected the Germans. I expected the Irish. I expected the English. Switzerland, England, and especially Wales did surprise me. But the main point, there were six ethnicities on this block. So it was already in 1900, a multi-ethnic block. There were no Poles on the block. Where did the adults work? Well, <clears throat> when I tracked them all down, I found that over half worked in the textile industry with many working in the cotton industry, but a great number working in the woolen industry. And of course the woolen industry was the Globe Mill. They lived across the street from the mill where they worked. There were um, in the, what I call the various industries, seven people worked in transport, including a blacksmith and a wagon maker. <clears throat> Um, seven laborers, um, some in heavy industry, but not many. Miscellaneous, uh, two bakers, people do have to eat. There was a barrel washer and a cigar stripper, a plumber. The servant was a woman. Somebody on the street actually uh, had a servant. And there were a few white collar people. In 1910, Poles were on the street. There were three houses that had poles. Interestingly, and there's where my knowledge of how to spell the name came into play. At 16 Stark Street, and the names then did not have, the numbers changed in 1916, so we're working with the original numbers, is Kadash, who arrived in 1907, had already filed papers to become an American citizen, was married with a child, and the records show that he and his wife purchased the house in February of 1910. I wonder, and my question, the house cost $2,000. Where did the money come from to buy the house? Did the two of them, had the two of them already, both husband and wife, saved enough money to buy the house? Or did they have a mortgage? If they had a mortgage, was it through a bank? Or was it private? Were there other Poles who were loaning money so people could buy houses? These are questions that are buried in family history, and I'd love to know the answers to them. One of the ways that Poles uh, managed to have houses is that they would rent out rooms in the house, and as they accumulate money, they would add additions and be able to rent out even more space in the house because the house was so much bigger now. The person that Kadash rented their house to, his name is Butler, but he came from Poland. Uh, and I, I couldn't figure that one out and I couldn't translate his name. I don't, I'm not confident that either name is correct. At the corner of Stark Street and Warren Street was Andrzej Macho and his family who had seven and all of them were now adult children. Again, the family is an economic unit. Even adult sons bring their money into the house and turn it over to their parents because the family is an economic unit. And if you're gonna get ahead, you have to be a unit. They too owned their house bought in November, 1908. Where they got the money was a little more perhaps evident because they arrived 10 years before and with seven people working, you could have uh, collect, saved enough money to buy the house. And that too cost about $2,000. I, I was intrigued with 
of the Sokolovsky family, which lived just across the street. They were on the southwest corner of Stark and Warren. And this was very interesting because um, the family came with three older children, had three more children here. The father worked as a, a railroad flagman, a gatekeeper. And at this point, when the trains came through the city on major streets like Court Street or Warren Street, big gates would come down to keep the um, mobile traffic from hitting into the train and getting killed by them. And that's what he did. He lowered that uh, gate. His youngest son went to Georgetown Medical School, became a doctor, came home, opened his practice in that house. And the word in the community was that Joseph Sokolowski, Dr. Joseph Sokolowski's family, his sisters in particular, worked in the factory to help pay for his medical school and his college training. The immigrants, um, perfect story. In 1915, New York State took a census as it did every five years for about 30 years. Uh, and so we can compare what happened, the, the, the changes. One more house added, this time the census taker caught all the houses. But now we have 185 people living there, an increase of uh, 54 people, um, both adults and children. The gender distribution didn't change all that much. Now there were more married people than single people. And there were more widowed people who were living on the block. Where were they born? Same question that we asked for the 1900 uh, census. In 1900, over 50% were born in the US, 44% born abroad. 15 years later, those numbers just flipped. Now we had less than 50% born in the US and more than 50% born abroad. And where were the new ones from? They were from Austria, meaning these were Poles. It's interesting to see with 41 adults on the street that they were all from Austrian Poland. I found a similar self-segregation, if you want, over on uh, Stephen Street where the people there were from the Russian partition. And of course, we know that on Lincoln Ave, most of the people who lived there were from Prussia. So there was this self-segregation going on. Some of it makes a lot of sense. That is, if you're coming to live with a relative and your relative lives on Stark Street, you're gonna become another person from Austria who lives on Stark Street, and maybe somebody from the village will join you. And then you make, you make workers who are also from nearby or are from Austria, and, and you can relate to them. Uh, nonetheless, there were tensions among these three. Remember, they had different policies, different practices. They were used to doing things in different ways. And so it wasn't always so smooth. Um, Polish immigrants on Stark Street, all of these are born in Austria. Um, there are the names, as far as I know, all but Jepka stayed. By, night, by the 1930 census, I could not find him. There were others who had left and moved to other cities, a few of them. But you can begin to see some of the relationships. Uh, Zabinski's sister, Zabinska's sister, was Mrs. Zizio uh, Olshovsky, and I'm not even sure that this is the spelling. I think she was the ne niece of Mrs. Uh, Sokolovsky. Um, uh, Voinas, I believe, is related to the people whose house they lived in, Lopata. Kurek and Zabinsky came together. So you, you can see lots and lots of these connections. Um, I looked uh, in this 1915 census to see where the people, when did they come? And <laughs> was surprised to find 1907 was the dividing year. Half of them came before 
1907. The other half came afterwards. And as you can see, 1914, it stops altogether. 1912, I suspect, is the, uh, the peak here. I suspect it's the peak because war was already becoming uh, probable in, in Europe and many of their villages would have been affected by the war as indeed Poland has often been the battleground and certainly was in World War I. What were their occupations of these Poles uh, who lived on Stark Street? Well, it changed. Um, these are all residents who lived on Stark Street. Now, only a third of them are employed in the textile industries. Two thirds are in other industries with many of them in heavy industry. They were skilled laborers or they were general laborers. I don't think it's because the textile industry was declining. I think rather because these other industries, especially the heavy industries that involve uh, manual, heavy, hard work and lots of labor, that they were growing, they were increasing. Uh, and that's where Poles in particular were finding work. Because when we look at the occupations of Poles in 1915, we see that um, they were, and this, they were a 33% of the adult residents um, were the Poles. Uh, not quite half worked in textiles, while more than half, almost 60% worked in non-textiles with a lot of them in as laborers, uh, laborers, machinists, molders. Again, this is heavy industry. This requires skills. Um, and all of these were, were men. In the textile industry, there was, I was quite surprised to see the number of women. I was surprised especially to see that they were married women because at this time, married women generally, because they had children, did not work outside the home. There was plenty of work to do in the home. They were having borders, they were managing money. They were trying to save as much money as they could um, they were having children, it, it, they didn't have the ability to go to work. Um, Dorota Manshars was newly wed, so she, she and her husband probably continued to work until um, they had children. And Bernice Voinas worked with her, her sister-in-law. Um, though she was married several years, she did not have children at this time. What else were the Stark Street Poles doing? Well, they were getting married. They were having children, keeping house. They were becoming citizens. They were saving money and they were buying property. Here are the marriages that I found of the people living on Stark Street in 1915. I was frankly surprised that there were so many whose marriages I could find. This is new for New York State. Um, you couldn't find marriage records before. You can now. The county began to require marriage licenses around 1911. And these marriage licenses will give the home the, where the person was born. It will give them their, it will give their current occupation and it will give the, the marriage license. Those are often misspelling of Polish names. But the certificate that the priest had to sign when the marriage was um, affected <clears throat> will give their correct Polish name because the priest knew how to spell it. They were ha these people who were married were having children. 37% um, of the kids on the street were born of Polish parents and they were all born in the US. They were young average age, what, four years, and they lived in only four houses out of 24 on the street. So you can imagine um, they had a lot of playmates. <clears throat> on the right, I've listed the, the children's names, uh, trying to put the correct or the American surname as, they, as it was spelled. Spoka, for example, had dropped the Z in the name. The Polish name is as Z, P-I-L-K-A. Um, they were young children, and you can see the spacing in age. Uh, generally, two, three years between between children, um, and uh, these probably were not the last children. So, in summary, 
on Stark Street. Remember, 1900, there, was, there were no poles on the street. 1910, we found our first um, two houses, two buildings that had poles. In 1915, we had five. And in 1920, we had 11. So the number was doubling like every five years. And I think if we plotted this out to 1930, we would find that between 19 and 20 of these 24 houses were occupied by poles. And if we could see the ownership, we would begin to see that many of them were um, bought by poles who had first lived here as young marrieds or perhaps even as single people. So in summary, when we step back and look at the community in West Utica, and it was a community. By 1920, the Poles had built two churches, a school, and a rectory, and they had prepared a convent for the nuns. They established a cemetery, which is still in use today. They raised a hundred, more than $100,000 for Pol Polish war relief and restoration the Polish state. They sent over 300 men as soldiers to the Polish and the U.S. armies who, and to fight with the Allies in France. They welcomed recreation of Poland as an independent country, a result in part of their po political activities here in Utica and in, elsewhere in the U.S. They filled local industries' needs for labor. There's no question about that. They started small businesses and a Polish language newspaper, which ran for more than 60 years. You can consult it at the Utica Public Library where there is a microfilm um, uh, of the newspaper. They survived a pandemic. They lost many people during that pandemic. Those names are listed in Polska. They were becoming a community that was working together and with less emphasis on their origins during partitions. There was still some, but they were seeing themselves now as a community and they continued to become American citizens. No question that the majority of them had come to stay and they did. I thank you for your, uh, your interest. This has been a pleasure for me to research this topic. There's so much more to learn. Um, there's lots of opportunity. I can see where sociologists and historians with a, their perspective could learn so much from our ancestors um, and from this community. And I hope my fond hope would be that they would begin to do some in-depth research on this community. So I thank you very much. And Rebecca, 